Hello and welcome to the 25th Hour, a newscast produced by the Carleton University School of Journalism. My name is Rachel Jaskula and this week we're shining the spotlight on stories from Ottawa's own. I'm Caitlin Fisher. On our show today, you'll be seeing passion for a sport that helps overcome an injury, anger and activism, live action role play and so much more. And I'm Nick Laws. Wherever you're watching, whether it be at home or on the go, we hope these stories and the people in them inspire you. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Mugali Samba. Our first story takes us to Parliament Hill. The Peace Tower is one of our nation's most enduring symbols. It's recognized around the world for its 92 meter shadow and the ever-present Canadian flag. It's at the peak of Parliament, and if you're looking for Flagmaster Robert Labonte after sunrise, that's where you'll find him. Quiet, peaceful, it's quite magical, first thing in the morning. My name is Robert Labonte, and I'm the flight master. It all starts back in the office, so we have a filing cabinet with flags. They're all registered, they're all numbered. Back in B90s, the government had an initiative that they took on where uh, Canadians would be able to request the flag that flew on the Peace Tower. So I'll take one out, put it in my bag, and uh, up we go. By the time, you know, 9, 10 o'clock hits, you're walking, you're trying to avoid running into people, and it's just very busy. I've added a few little quirks. So there's two lions on either side of the entrance. So the one on the left, I usually just fist pump him. You take the elevator up to the observation deck. From there, it's all stairs. There's 141 steps uh, to go uh, all the way to the top of the tower. When I first came here, I honestly had no idea that changing the flag was a thing. But I can't get enough of it. I've always been very proud of Canada. So to me, this is the ultimate job. And whenever you know, you're driving by, you see billboards, they have a picture of the Peace Tower, the flag waving, uh, that sense of pride, knowing that, that I'm able to help to do that and that nobody knows is fine with me. Sometimes I'll just find myself just up there for an extra couple minutes, just looking around, just soaking it all in, even, even now, uh, after all this time. You go up there, you're by yourself. You feel like you're on top of, of the whole country. Canada. As I'm coming down, I usually sing O Canada. Basically, it's just my way of saying thanks. I think I've hit the jackpot. I found a job that I love, and on top of that, I get to change the flag. I would do this till I die if they'd let me. Canada. We stand on guard for thee, O oh, Canada. We stand on guard for thee. Love you, Canada. It's amazing to think about what happens behind the scenes on Parliament Hill. I didn't even realize that anyone had the job of changing the flag. I love how much he loves his job. Sandra Inglis is another Ottawa resident who loves what she does. 
She overcame a huge challenge to be where she is today. A car accident in 1988 changed the course of her life as a member of the Canadian National Synchronized Swimming Team. After years out of the water, Inglis is back beside the pool, coaching the Carleton University Ravens Synchro Team. My name is Sandra Inglis, and I started synchronized swimming when I was eight years old. Let's, let's just land drill that once. Land drill, ready, and five, six, seven, eight. All through uh, when I was a young adult uh, in high school, university, my identity was often tied to synchronized swimming. When someone asked me who I was, I would say I'm a synchronized swimmer. I was on the Canadian national team. One day I was on my way to pick up my duet partner, Lisa, for practice. And I was driving my car, tire blue. Um, I lost control of my car and my car rolled over my left arm and crushed it. They didn't think I would have a lot of um, use or mobility out of it and certainly didn't think that I'd ever be able to swim again. Okay, under. My goals at that point in my synchronized swimming career was certainly not to sort of swim and, and have a perfect 10. Uh, it was just to learn how to use my fingers again and learn how to open a door and um, you know work my, with my physiotherapist to try and straighten and bend my arm. There were a lot of people who were part of my world that were trying to help me come back and I did. Um, and I made the Canadian national team again. So throws have become really commonplace, and synchronized swimming is very sort of acrobatic now, but it wasn't at the time. And so it was the first team, the team that won the 10. It was a Cats theme to the musical Cats. It was the first time that the team had actually thrown someone out of the water. I was fortunate enough that I got to be the flyer. I ended up retiring from swimming and I got into coaching at a very high level. So a lot of years coaching and then eventually um, weaning myself off, moving more into consulting and then stepping away for a number of years before I started back up again. When I started getting back in, I, I sort of jumped back in with both feet. I am a coach at a club called Go Capital Synchro and I'm very fortunate to be involved with the Carleton Ravens uh, varsity synchronized swimming team. Be more, so be more comfortable. So, uh, for me, synchronized swimming isn't just a sport that allowed me to develop athletically. I learned how to persevere and develop, you know, something that we call grit. And you have to be gritty. You can't give up because it's easy to give up. But I think if you give up and you go down that path, I don't know if you can ever come back from it or very, very difficult. And so for me, a far easier choice was just um, bearing down, persevering, and going from one goal to the next. And certainly when I was lying in my hospital bed and, um, you know, going through skin, skin grafts for I don't know how many up-team times and, you know, I wasn't sure whether or not I would, able be, it would be able to sort of even use my fingers again. Certainly I wasn't thinking about the national team and I wasn't thinking about being gritty. Those aren't things that you think about. I didn't let myself think that this was it, and I think that's become sort of a defining moment for me. If my coaches were as dedicated as English, I would have been in the major leagues by now. But here we are. Anchoring really isn't that bad, Nick. <laughs> Andrew Knox is also a coach, a professional musician, and a music teacher. Many kids want to grow up to be rock stars, but they may not always have an appreciation for what lies behind the music. Knox wants the students to know there's a history behind every note. One, two, three, ba -do -dee, ba -do -do -da. I started playing instruments when, well, I was probably about five or six, I started playing piano. And then I kind of graduated my way into other instruments like drums, uh, guitar, that kind of stuff. The 
when I chose cl a classical type instrument uh, as my as my main instrument is mainly because I don't know I just understood a lot about what went into playing a musical instrument before and uh, for example trumpet's one of those instruments that really even to this day gives me a hard time. No, yeah, that was my bad. That was my bad. Yeah, can we cut that part out? Uh, I still don't understand everything there is to know about the uh, about the trumpet. Uh, and I guess other instruments, I don't either, but I found that initially it gave me a lot more troubles and I just became more intrigued by playing trumpet. I basically grew up in a, in a household that gave, likes to give back to people, like my, my parents foster. Growing up with that idea of giving back is I felt that with me learning <clears throat> so much about music, it made no sense to not give back to a musical community. Uh, I also like it when I teach somebody something and then they take it and they can then practice it for themselves and become their own uh, musician. I find that there's a lot of value of practicing classical music. Um, it's, it ultimately adds a foundation to any style of music that we play. Uh, historically, without classical music, we don't have our pop music. And the, the idea that we learn a good amount of theory behind classical music, and it's, it's all laid out in very specific ways, that uh, it helps us to be able to understand better about the type of music that we want, or well, most kids here want to play. There's loads, of, there's loads of theory that comes from classical music that I use all the time uh, that I feel as though it's, without it we wouldn't be as well prepared to be a professional musician. To describe the energy is, it's very hard to describe. You know, sometimes people throw things onto stage and you're just like, wow, I created that much energy. No matter if it's positive or negative, you're just creating a mood or a feeling in somebody else. It's just kind of magical. Sometimes our passions and hobbies take unexpected twists. Take Kareen Halpenny, for example. She makes armor into an accessory. Let's take a look at how the art of making chainmail jewelry has helped her come out of her shell. My name is Kareen Halpenny. I make handmade chainmail jewelry. I think it's definitely getting more successful. Um, I've been in business for almost four years now. My business is the job that I enjoy doing, so I'm hoping that one day I can have a job that I enjoy that also pays the bills. All you do with chain mail is you just hook one ring at a time. You take a pair of pliers and then you just hook it through wherever you need to for the pattern. And so I took a beaded jewelry class at a local craft store and I really enjoyed making it, um, but the finished product wasn't really, didn't suit my aesthetic. I'm kind of a clumsy person, so I, I don't want stuff that can break easily and I wanted something a little bit more urban or industrial looking because that was more of my personal taste. So I just went online and I was looking for different types of jewelry and I stumbled upon chainmail and fell in love with how it looked and when I started making it I fell in love with that too. The first one took me over an hour and a half um, and uh, I may or may not have thrown it across the room on uh, more than one occasion and sometimes getting just that last ring in is nearly impossible. <laughs> By the time I'd done like four or five of them, I felt a lot better, but the first few were a big struggle. <laughs> I find making the chainmail jewelry is really relaxing. It's sort of just a, like a repetitive motion. You're just doing something over and over again, hundreds of times, and you just kind of focus on that and like the rest of the world just kind of slips away. It's sort of like you're expressing yourself, um, but also you feel safe when you're wearing it. So when I first started making the chainmail jewelry, it was just for my own 
personal enjoyment for my own uh, wearing of it. But I think I was enjoying it a little bit too much because I just basically ended up having too many pieces. Like, what am I going to do with 30 bracelets? At the time, I had a roommate who, uh, he was a math tutor. So he had students coming into the apartment and uh, like their parents would just wait in the living room. I would hang my pieces there. And so that was sort of my first taste at like, having a business. So I said, oh, well, maybe I can just keep making stuff, which is what I like to do, and then sell it so I can basically pay for my materials. I think that my jewelry has helped me grow as a person in terms of getting myself out there more. Um, when I'm making it, I'm obviously pretty much just, you know, alone at home making it. Uh, but if you have to sell it, you have to go out and meet new people. So that's definitely helped me to open up more as a person and be, I guess, less afraid of strangers. <laughs> I usually tend to be more of an introverted person. So having to even just show up is really putting myself out there. There's people that are going to these, you know, handmade craft, local artisan events. They want to know the person behind the piece. So you have to, you're forced to open up and talk to all sorts of different people. I've met a lot of, we call it kind of like the maker community in Ottawa. Um, so I have a few friends from there. Um, like I know people that make so many interesting things. So I don't know that I would have ever met them if I hadn't been participating in these sorts of events. I didn't know that there was this whole group of like other people that were doing it like me. I always like that I just post a picture of something new that I'm proud of and then I get like a hundred people that liked it and that, that makes me feel good. My heart is pretty happy right now. I think I'm in a good place. At this stage, like in my personal life, I'm just, I'm very happy with where my business is. I'm excited for, you know, what's to come in my personal life and uh, just things are pretty well. I have a happy heart. Ashley Corshane is a social activist who has always been passionate about storytelling. Podcasting has become a creative outlet for Corshane to share his experiences as an Indigenous person in Canada today. This summer, Corshane was a part of the reoccupation movement on Parliament Hill, an event which he says changed his life. Through his podcast, Corshane is speaking up and transferring the tradition of oral storytelling over the airwaves. Canada 150 isn't anything to me. I'm angry because people don't know. They should know. They should know the history. Nobody, no Native person ever said, yeah, we'll, we'll give up your lands to you. The reason why I do what I do is because I'm angry. If I didn't have that anger as a driving force, would I really be doing this? My name is Ashley Corshane. I am the creator of Skoden Chronicles podcast. I guess there was a collective vision for everybody involved to see teepees all over the lawn of Parliament. We got to the fence and the second that we crossed the line, police sort of swarmed in on us and tried to either take the poles or push us back out. But there was enough of us to get just inside and place kind of like place it on the inside of the gate like this so they couldn't push it out we didn't get permission from anybody you know they didn't say yeah okay fine we grant you permission to put it on the slope we just said yeah we're going to put it up while negotiations are happening it went up 
and as it did, the rain stopped. When we woke up, Justin Trudeau just kind of shows up and with his Canada 150 jean jacket and, you know, hey, uh, can I come in? I started talking and I pretty much told him that we don't have a renewed relationship. The, the day that I can come or my children can come and practice ceremony on our own lands without, you know, being held up at gunpoint. Um, then yeah, well, we'll talk about a new, new relationship, but we don't have that relationship. And when I told him that, he goes, yeah, but I'm the first prime minister to come and see you guys. And it just seemed very self-congratulatory. And then he, he left. It was a very powerful time. Uh, there was a lot of energy, um, but I'm glad that we did it. It changed me after. I was very, very angry after, but empowered at the same time. After, after everything was done, I remember walking out of uh, Parliament Hill and still feeling connected to this earth, you know. It almost felt like buildings would move out of my way. Check, check, one, two. My podcast, The Skoden Chronicles, um, sort of takes a decolonial uh, lens at different issues or topics or matters that happen in Canada that, you know, involve Indigenous people and just sort of kind of give an alternative narrative that isn't there in mainstream news media or in any media, really, um, for anybody who wants to listen, anybody who wants to learn. Ani. My name is Ashley Krishane, the most stoic of Indians. It's an outlet for me. I am angry. I need some place to put that, right? So my podcast is a good place to put that. I just see it as like a, as a continuance of the oral tradition when I'm doing this. Knowledges and truths, those are all legitimate. And, and it's just a matter of Canada seeing that as well. Ottawa is full of artists speaking through their work. Whitney Lewis-Smith is one of those people. She makes an unconventional statement with her photography. Lewis-Smith uses animals, plants, and insects to make us re-examine our relationship to the natural world. Her artistic approach to photography is a unique combination of new and old. My name is Whitney Lewis-Smith and I'm a photographic artist. Uh, I do some commercial work, I teach college, and the majority of my practice is uh, my own studio work that I sell through my gallery here in Ottawa and in New York City. I grew up in Chelsea, uh, in the Gatineau Park. I, my backyard was the woods, and I was an only child, so I spent a lot of time exploring, playing in the mud, catching frogs. And so I really developed a love for animals and the environment as a, as a child. The underwater world became a big part of what I did, teaching diving, and I was living on the west coast doing that. So, um, no, I, I would say that it's just inherently part of me, and it's always been something that's been at the forefront of, of what I want to do in my life. The ideas that I deal with in my work are mostly talking about consumerism, uh, the environment, how we make use of uh, the land, the earth, and how we overuse. So a lot of the more current pieces that I've done just show sort of, um, you know, an abundance but in excess to the point where it's a bit grotesque. And I do want people to get a sense of, um, you know, that, that we take advantage, that we overuse, that we exploit, and that it's not necessary and we're using something so, so beautiful in such an ugly way. I just sort of created a melting pot of old methods and new technology and I melted them together into something that I hadn't seen before, something that's my own. And despite the methods being traditional, I think adding a contemporary aspect into the ideas behind the work is, um, is unusual when you're dealing with alternative process photography. 
So I can't use living animals, I can't use anything that moves. Um, it all has to be built and set up and very still. So taxidermy came into play because obviously the environmental issues, animals, all of that is uh, very important to me, something that I want to talk about. And uh, it, it was a way for me to get my ideas across. I refuse to use new taxidermy. If I do, it's from an animal that has died of natural causes or uh, was, never, was never born. I, I'm working with a fawn right now that was a stillborn fawn. And uh, so I purchased that from a woman who got it from a deer farmer. And they every year have a few stillborn animals and instead of throwing them away, they end up with me. I don't even have to leave my living room to, to photograph these things. I could order them right to my door if I want. So that also talks about consumerism and the way the world is going. And I, I do feel like the things that exist in my images won't exist in another hundred years. We're struggling with taking responsibility for the environment and the older generations are saying well it's the responsibility of the younger folks to manage this and we're going like really this is all on our shoulders so we have to figure out a new way to do everything and a lot of us are sort of turning a blind eye and maybe not participating in an active way the way we should be you know whether it's not buying plastic or um, being conscious of the way we deal with garbage and what we purchase and how we use water and all of those things. We all need to make a major change and uh, it's hard, it's really hard, but hopefully we can do it. I kind of feel like maybe we'll just wait until things start really falling apart. But it's unfortunate. I would really hope that we can get our asses together and figure it out before then. Hogsback Park may seem like your everyday standard green space, but for Ryan Sutherland, it's a battleground. From wizards to assassins, live action role playing has become an escape from the constraints of everyday life. This role playing, often called LARP for short, turns fantasies into reality and gives people a chance to step into a whole new world. My name is Ryan Sutherland and uh, I'm 35 years old. I originally come from northern New Brunswick. Um, I work as a technician in an automotive garage and uh, I guess I also LARP. Uh, well, LARP in general is uh, live action role playing. Uh, a lot of the time it uh, sort of manifests as being like uh, the old Dungeons and Dragons games except uh, I suppose uh, with slightly greater physical component to it, where uh, people, rather than relying on dice, are sort of relying on their reactions and their wits a bit more. Uh, I play uh, Varen. He's an assassin. He uses, generally speaking, a long sword and a short sword, as well as the bow and arrow. Uh, and he tends to like to mediate circumstances in a way where it's mutually beneficial for everyone, and you know, very much enjoys when it can't be that way and everyone gets to fight. I found that a lot of the, the uh, RP elements of this is sort of a, a way to experiment with aspects of self that uh, maybe I was too shy to let out more or maybe um, I just want to sort of uh, experiment or play with. Before I started playing Varen, I was much more withdrawn. I'd let myself become very withdrawn. But uh, Varen himself isn't very withdrawn. And I could put my own, you know, introversion aside uh, for, for the, the short period of time, relatively speaking, that, that would be required to sort of play Varen. And that really sort of opened me up to being more, more back in the world, as opposed to sort of inside questioning, you know. Um, and I guess in that regard, uh, playing Garen really brought me out of my shell. My parents were pacifists, and uh, very much so. You know, it was very much their belief that, um, you know, uh, if someone's bullying, don't pay them any attention. They just want the attention. And if you don't pay the attention, they'll leave you alone. 
we moved around a fair bit. And uh, there was a period of time where I was bullied a lot. You know what I mean? And I really was trying their, their sort of very, sort of like, yeah, don't let it bother you. And that didn't work in that setting. Uh, really the only thing that helped was when I sort of got fed up and uh, talked my way into getting free martial art classes at this one martial arts school in Nova Scotia. Um, and once I started doing that, uh, people were less likely to want to try and push me around. So I started to think about, um, you know, martial arts as an immune system against violence. And I found that over time you'd see more and more of this uh, glorification of these excellent Mortal Kombat style finishing moves. You know what I mean? We're like, oh yeah, if someone goes to shove you, you do this and it breaks their arm in three places and then, you know, like, whoa, you know. Uh, eventually it, it made me feel um, almost sick. Uh, the, 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 the constant encountering of that sort of subculture in the martial arts. So uh, when I started doing the LARP stuff, I had really moved away from formal study uh, and had been doing all of that sort of soul searching and had to reconcile that, that feeling of the reality of violence with that feeling of safety that, that a understanding of violence can provide. I'm very much enjoying myself and as long as I can stay uh, engaged and sort of, you know, navigate the social dynamics of everything fairly well, then I can see it being something that I'll continue to do. While there are many ways for people to reinvent themselves, Ottawa-based makeup artist Aya Ahmed is on a mission to bring out her clients' inner beauty. Even though some members of the Muslim community don't approve of her art form, Ahmed has found ways to reconcile her passion with her culture and religion. What I love about makeup is you can transform yourself or express yourself or how do I say this? Um, enhance your beauty um, with makeup. That's why I love it so much. I feel every girl is pretty, and then once you enhance her with makeup, she's just like balling. I hear so many stories from women. Like, this is like a normal thing. Like, oh my God, I just got a divorce. Oh my God, um, I got, he cheated on me. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like, so many stories I hear on a daily basis. And then while I'm doing their makeup and they finish, they look in that mirror and they're just like, thank you. And it's, it's not just about looking pretty, it's feeling good from the inside. And I, I love that reaction on, on the mirror. Like, I love when they're happy. I started nano needling um, in the beginning of the year of 2017. Nano is one needle and it's a very thin needle penetrating into the skin, depositing pigment. Cool. <laughs> I have hair. I have hair. <laughs> Look at me, I'm hairy. <laughs> Cosmetic procedures that I've done would be, um, I just recently did a rhinoplasty in Lebanon and I did do lip fillers. Uh, I don't think that you should be hiding it. I mean, if, if you're private about it, I understand, but I think as a blogger, I think it's really powerful to do, uh, to convey that message and say, you know what, if, if that's bothering you, do it. So yeah, I'm just waiting for them to go down a lot and then, fill them in lightly rather than a lot because they did go overboard last time. Yeah. I was born in Ottawa. Um, it was great. It's a very, I would say, safe, nice community. I know that I have bigger opportunity in Toronto but I'm here because I can't buy family, right? <laughs> I think my number one supporter is my husband. And I feel like, I mean, I could have accomplished whatever I want without him, but I feel like his support uh, really made it fast paced. Like it came quicklier because of his support. So thank you, husband. After I finished high school, my dad really wanted me to enter the world of sciences. I mean, I did go to school for my dad, unfortunately. I did pharmacy. I mean, 
I have it, you know, if something happens, I still have my pharmacy technician diploma, so it's not bad. So when I first started makeup, um, there wasn't like many people in our community doing makeup. For me to come out, especially as a Muslim hijabi, and portraying myself on YouTube and just in general wearing large amounts of makeup, it's sort of like, you know, I got the stares, I got judgment. I still wear makeup. I still go outside with makeup. Uh, is it against my religion? Yes. Do I do it? Yes. Um, is it haram? Yes, it is. I, I feel like I can express myself more and I would, I would have been a huge actress in the Middle East if I was allowed to do that, if my religion allowed me to do that. But that's why I stepped into the visual arts where, yes, I still put on makeup and it's still a sin and it's still attractive, but, you know, I feel like if I don't allow myself to do something, I'm just going to repel. Like, I, it's really, really hard for someone that has so much talent to um, not express at all. I believe in it. I mean, if I didn't believe in it, I, I wouldn't be Muslim. But I feel like I've developed a better relationship with God over years um, through my tests in life and through my hard battles and yeah. After watching that, I'm thinking I should contact her for a makeover. What do you guys think? Do my brows look good? I think you could use some help with that, Nick. I think it's safe to say there's been a wide range of talent in today's show. We hope you enjoyed meeting some of the wonderful people here in the nation's capital. That's all from us today. Thank you for tuning in to the 25th hour. Your new day starts now.